This conference will now be recorded. All right, good morning. Welcome, everybody. So first of all, I want to say thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. We have a great lineup of speakers today who are excited to share with you information that will help support you and your team and the great work that you all are doing. My name is Kimberly Cook. I'll be the moderator for today. I'm the Northern California Business Development Manager for Agriman Premium Soil Products. Cecilia Rios is our host. She's the Supervising Environmental Services Specialist with the City of San Jose, and she's doing all the behind the scenes magic to keep everything running smoothly. Today's webinar is SB 1383 Part 2, which is Session 3 of a 13-part webinar series brought to you for free by the Swana Gold Rush Chapter here in Northern California. Our webinar series occurs once a month on a Friday from noon to 1 p.m. Pacific time. These webinars are free to members and non-members, so please let friends and colleagues know about the series so they can join us as well. Check out our Swana Gold Rush Chapter website on the events page to learn more about the SWANA webinar series. You can register for upcoming sessions here, find links to previous sessions, and learn more about opportunities to sponsor the webinar series. <clears throat> if you're not currently receiving the webinar announcement emails from us and would like to stay plugged in, please send us an email at swanagoldrush at gmail.com, and I'll get you on that list for the emails. Also, would love to hear feedback from you about today's webinar, ideas for future webinars, really anything that's on your mind, reach out to us at swanagoldrush at gmail.com. This SWANA webinar series is only possible with the dedication and hard work of our SWANA webinar team members, which include Ruth Abbey of Abbey & Associates, Tim Rabley of HDR Engineers, Christine Wolf of Recology, and of course our host, Cecilia Rios. If you have a SWANA certification that you need to maintain, and you're, and you're registered for this webinar, you'll automatically receive the Continuing Education Unit, also known as a CEU. SWANA provides certification courses in landfill operations, composting programs, HHW, zero waste, and many more topics. So I definitely encourage you to check out SWANA's website to learn more about the certification courses offered and to get plugged in. SWANA requires all those who are certified through one of our courses to obtain 30 CEU credits across three years in order to maintain certification. So each of these webinars, uh, and we have 13, uh, you'll get one credit per webinar. <clears throat> this webinar series is also only possible from sponsorships from viewers like you. I want to give a sincere thanks to our sponsors for this webinar. Rethink Waste, SalinasValleyRecycles.org, and Recology are all $1,500 sponsors for this webinar. So a big thanks to that. And HDR is a $750 sponsor for this webinar. So again, thank you kindly to everyone who did sponsor. And I encourage you to check out our uh, website to learn more about ways you can sponsor. We have different sponsorship buckets, which will allow us to promote your company or organization in a variety of ways. You can check out our website to learn more about ways to sponsor or contact Christine Wolf at Recology for more information. At this point, we've all attended plenty of these sorts of online webinars. The particular platform we're using for this series is GoToMeeting. And so there's two things that I'd like to show you that will help improve your viewing experience and your participation experience. Um, so as you can see on my PowerPoint, this is in relation to the, the web-based uh, platform for viewing this. <clears throat> so you'll see in the, in the top center, there's a little section that's normally defaulted to view who's talking um, or it could be defaulted to something else. And there's some up-down arrows. If you click on those, you can change what you're viewing. So if you click on hide everyone, then that will give you the view that focuses on the PowerPoint and less on people's webcams. Additionally, the, uh, if you have questions that you'd like to send to us for me to ask the different presenters, on the right side of your screen, on the top corner, you'll see I have circled uh, a little bubble. And so that's for chatting. And down at the bottom, similarly, there's an up-down arrow. If you click on that, you can toggle between who you want to send the message to. Uh, if you, you can, of course, send it to everyone, or you can specifically send it to the organizer, and it will come to Cecilia and myself.
Please make sure that your mic is muted at all times and that your webcam is off during the presentation. The speakers today are Dr. John Kohler, a senior engineer at York Engineering, Matt Cotton, the owner of Integrated Waste Management Consulting, and Neil Bolton, the president of Blue Ridge Services. After each pre presenter has finished speaking, I'll ask them a few questions, so you're welcome to send messages in the chat box, and then immediately after each speaker, I'll present the questions to them. <clears throat> Additionally, at the end of all presentations, we'll have more time for questions. And without further ado, <clears throat> Dr. John Kohler has 30 years of professional experience as an air quality consultant based in the San Francisco Bay Area. He has managed, managed numerous projects involving air quality permitting and compliance, human health risk assessment, and risk of upset for a wide range of facilities. For composting, biogas, and other waste management projects, his experience includes evaluation of waste diversion projects proposed in the Salinas Valley and in the city of Los Angeles that featured composting, anaerobic digestion, and the thermal treatment of municipal solid waste. Additionally, he works with projects involving biomass to syngas and MSW to ethanol in several new or expanded composting facilities in the Bay Area Quality Management District and the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. John, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if my slides appear yet. Okay, um, not yet. We'll yet. give that do, presenter control. I got to do something here. Oh, there you go. We can see it. You're in business. All right. Thank you. And I'll just jump right into this. Uh, my talk today will be on uh, permitting challenges uh, required under uh, SB 1383, specifically uh, the focus is air permitting. Uh, so just, I just there's going to be plenty of discussion on, on uh, 1383 in many aspects to the, in this hour, but just by way of quick introduction, passed in uh, 2016, uh, requiring a 50% reduction in organic waste uh, by 2020. Of course, that didn't happen. And then 75% reduction by 2025. The implementing regulations were finally adopted uh, in January of this year. And uh, the figures I had from 2018, there was roughly about 5 million tons of composting capacity in the state. And according to a 2017 report from Cal Recycle, uh, the, expect, the anticipated additional waste diversion rate uh, needed to be on the order of about 20 million tons. I ran across some very recent numbers, and that, num that numbers may still be between uh, 15 and 18, but still quite a significant challenge. So uh, obstacles to achieving compost capacity includes deciding permitting and building of new organics management facilities, uh, which face market challenges, uh, waste, uh, feedstock, so forth, public acceptance issues, uh, odors, and uh, none of my backyard, and uh, cross-regulatory requirements. But an important set of these requirements are air quality regulations, and, that, and that's the focus of this talk. So I'm going to go for the initial size pretty quickly here. It's just background, then I'll spend a little more time on the, on the meat of the permitting. Uh, keep this slide in mind for a moment in your minds that this was as of 2018, the siting of existing compost facilities in the state. Darker counties are more highly populated counties. And you'll see that the majority, uh, a large number of these reside in the very I'm long, you have to pull out your bread. Excuse me? All right, Jack. Uh, in the Bay Area, the South Coast uh, Air District area here, and then in the San Joaquin Valley. The uh, next slides show non attainment areas for ozone, uh, for which VOCs, the compound of interest in composting for emissions are precursors and show as non-attainment areas federally, South Coast Bay Area, San Joaquin Valley, and then uh, as for the state standard, expanded areas. And so those are the same areas where we have the most stringent air quality standards. For just a moment on uh, background air permitting, just highlights, uh, there are new source review requirements, which are going to be tighter in, in those three major air districts, South Coast, 
our district, uh, San Joaquin Valley and Bay Area, that require a lowest achievable emission rate or best available control technology backed, essentially the best control that has been achieved in practice for the, for the type of facility being looked at. Uh, emission offsets, if you exceed certain emission thresholds that require emission reduction credits to, to obtain those offsets. Uh, which are mission reductions at your facility or elsewhere to allow for the increased emissions from the project. Uh, and then a statewide requirement for health risk assessments to be sure that permitted facilities don't cause uh, potential health risks in the surrounding area. Odor impacts, of course, are always big. Uh, and, and as they focus in the Bay Area, or the, excuse me, the uh, air quality agencies in California. Uh, and, most of these projects have to go some sort of uh, CEQA or Environmental, California Environmental Quality Act uh, EIR clearance. So getting back to the big three air districts that I was just referring to uh, and talking about the best available control technology requirements uh, per process unit, essentially the, the composting would be one process unit. Uh, the trigger for BACT is essentially any project. It's one pound per day emissions, uh, in this case for VOC. San Joaquin Valley, pretty stringent as well, two pounds per day. In Bay Area, 10 pounds per day. Uh, and that offset before you will have to start worrying about providing offsets, the, the thresholds, offset thresholds, four tons per year in the South Coast District, 10 tons per year in the San Joaquin Valley District, and the Bay Area essentially is 35 tons per year. The threshold is 10, but that air district will provide the ERCs or offset credits up to 35 and 35 and beyond, then you'd have to offset to zero. So that's a sort of quick run through on air quality. I could spend all day on that, but we wanna be moving on to uh, the focus of this talk, which is uh, uh, permitting and specifically uh, compost uh, and other organic waste aversion project, projects. And so just some highlights in process considerations in permitting include um, when going through the permitting process, a well-defined project description that's very important, including a description of the composting technology, uh, aerated static piles, or the type of in vessel system, for example, a feedstock, is it green waste, is it municipal solid waste, food waste, you have a co-composting project, so on. And throughput is very important to define your daily and annual maximums as well as your expected average uh, daily and annual emissions. Uh, need to address emissions. We'll be talking more on that in a few slides. Uh, and for composting and process, composting process and feedstock piles would be VOCs, uh, ammonia, and toxic emissions from the VOC emissions. For particulate matter emissions, these would come from material handling operations and fugitive dust uh, from on site truck or vehicle travel. It's on site, they don't have jurisdiction for off site travel. And this is not tailpipe emissions, this is the, the dust that's, picked, that's kicked up on site. Uh, tailpipe emissions are responsibility of the ARB, not air districts. So, um, so you need to address those emissions. And then uh, what emission factors you'd be using. Uh, VOC emission factors applied to composting stockpile emissions and uh, speciation of toxics, individual uh, compounds in the VOCs, which I'll touch upon later. Uh, the applicant needs to document the emission estimation methodologies and abatement efficiencies to be used. So when you're getting to this point of the permit process, communications with the agency can be can be helpful. Uh, you will be talking to them anyway, but it would be helpful to engage them. So the remainder of this presentation will summarize recent applications that York has been involved in. This slide here. Uh, and I'm going to be um, talking about them sort of all together, but sort of key key lessons learned from this. In this case, uh, the, these projects include five uh, within the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and one from the San Joaquin Valley uh, Air District. And the feedstocks for municipal solid waste, 
uh, food waste and green uh, green waste, uh, ranging from about 16,000 ton per year facilities all the way up to about 650,000 ton per year facilities, and representing a total throughput of about 1.5 million. So they added new capacity with these six projects, about a million tons per year. Keeping in mind the first slide that um, that's still a small fraction of what would be needed uh, projected under SB 1383. So the composting systems in these projects were positive and negative aerated static piles, negative piles with air pulled through them and vented the bow filters, positive piles with air pushed through them, vented mostly through compost covers, and in some cases the curing piles uh, did not have those. Uh, one project was an in-vessel system, positively aerated and invented to a, a biofilter. Uh, so emission abatement uh, in, in these projects included uh, biofilters, as I mentioned, uh, best management practices. And for PM control, uh, when a project had, had uh, indoor uh, material handling, uh, we, we had bag houses, but otherwise other best management practices or, or watering to suppress dust. Uh, two of these projects uh, were proposed in phases, later phases to be dependent on the feedstock market. And a lot of that has to do with the offsets that are being required. Uh, there were a range over these projects. One project proponent had to use about 50 ton per year of banked offset credits, and the other uh, will be a challenge for them to acquire the offsets that uh, they were permitted at. Uh, the two projects that had received their permits of these six so far had extensive permitting timelines due to a number of factors uh, and including project changes uh, during the um, project design changes during the uh, agency reviews, multiple rounds of permit condition reviews and public comment requirements. And I'll touch upon those in just a bit. Also, health risk assessments performed for these projects demonstrated less than significant impacts. So, Key factors in air permitting include emission factors. If you have emission factors that are too high, that'll have a direct impact on your permitting costs and potentially feasibility. And so I have closing slides. I'll present a comment or two on that. Uh, some project design and throughput changes may occur during the permitting process, as I met, just mentioned, which can cause delays. Uh, in one case, a project as originally design had to go through redesign for the biofilter configuration to comply with health risk assessment runs to show less than significant health risk issues. And as I said, both projects went through a permit condition negoti negotiation process uh, that involved uh, many parties and, and many rounds of reviews. Uh, examples of these included uh, temperature and moisture control, stability measurements and compost piles and, and stock feedstock temperatures, uh, and then a few things I'll, 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 uh, I'll mention in, this, in the next slide or two. Another area of negotiations uh, that was on conditions that could interfere with the ability to comply with requirements with other agencies. And so, for example, limitations on the reuse of runoff and leachate, um, temperature limitations that increase compliance risk due to the nature of the uh, biological process and the need to maintain temperatures above certain thresholds to assure pathogen destruction. So had to balance these things when negotiating with the air with the air agencies. Um, let's see, that's probably enough. Uh, so and then another point I guess I'll make, and I had a few more, uh, in going through this, limiting the extent of process monitoring and, and uh, designing off ramps and, 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 and on ramps for monitoring requirements in the permit conditions. Um, to reflect project performance was uh, some of the things that we talked about uh, in permit negotiations. So uh, to, to wrap up on uh, permit conditions, some key drivers have included those monitoring requirements, uh, including a pile of fire potential and, and odor potential. Uh, there were some concerns that Feedstock uh, and pile temperature uh, uh, had, could have the perceived risk of pile fibers, uh, excuse me, pile, pile fires that involved extensive measurement of pile temperatures and corrective actions. 
such as taking a pile apart if a temperature at any one location uh, at any one location exceeded those thresholds. And so coming up with reasonable permit conditions for, for things like that. Air quality management agencies that permit composting facilities do want to support the state diversion initiatives of the state, but they're also uh, keen on satisfying uh, that facilities will be able to comply with their regulatory requirements without impacting communities that they operate within. So uh, given kind of the quick examples I launched through, um, suffice it to say that we think uh, so, engagement with air agency staff early and often uh, can be important. Uh, define your project and design details clearly and minimize changes if possible. Provide sufficient detail to minimize uh, requests for further information and expect, negotiate, expect to negotiate uh, permit conditions. So yeah, probably, okay. Getting, getting there, almost done. So a uh, final word on the mission factors that I promised at the beginning. Um, as examples here, I show default emission factors for VOC and ammonia for composting uncontrolled green waste and food waste in the three major air districts. And they're in terms of pounds permitted per ton of waste composted. Uh, for projects with site-specific data from source tests, York found that in general, and at least in these projects, uh, they provided for lower emission factors than these default emission factors that the districts would otherwise use. Uh, in the case of aerated static piles that are at well aerated, we saw VOC at about one half to perhaps an order of magnitude below the default, more in one case, ammonia at about an order of magnitude below, and toxics one or more orders of magnitude lower than the um, default speciation profiles in use now. So as a quick example on this next uh, slide before conclusions, uh, if you assume an 800 ton per day facility and uh, a maximum of 365 days times that, not the maximum annual may not be that, but it's for the purposes of this uh, example, the midpoint of this range is about the midpoint of the facilities I was just talking about. Assuming 80% control on the biofilter, your estimated uh, VOC tons are still uh, about 100 tons per year. Uh, but if you had an order of magnitude reduction in your uh, emission factors due to representative source tests, uh, that goes down to about 10 tons per year, uh, a big difference and dramatic impact on the offset requirements. Just as an example, if you assume a going rate today in the Bay Area about $15,000 per ton per year at an offset ratio of 1.15, you get about on the order of $1.8 million in offset costs, as opposed to, in this example, $180,000. So in conclusion, uh, our experience has shown that the timeline for composting facilities, permitting them in the air agencies are, are running about two to three years at this point from the start of the effort. Um, air static piles, piles and other aeration technologies, well, uh, reduced VOCs versus open windrows, but at a greater capital investment. However, in the major air districts, uh, that's essentially back now, uh, the aerated static piles or other types of aeration technologies. And, um, and as more compost expansion gets permitted, the offsets availability will decrease and, the, and costs will increase. The cost of compliance with air permit conditions that can be set up can be significant in some jurisdictions. I mentioned site-specific source tests by qualified self-testing firms. They measure less emissions and can be well worth the investment. Um, just ran across uh, that Cal Recycle recently awarded a contract to research and refresh composting emission factors. So they're aware of the importance of this issue. Uh, and large composting projects require careful planning and extended permitting pipelines, timelines, uh, early and continuous engagement is uh, important to avoid surprises. So at, at that, I'm finished with my prepared remarks. And I'll, and I'll turn it back over uh, to Kimberly. Okay, John, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, we had one question, but it was directed to the group of speakers. So I'm going to hold that till the end of the presentation. Sure. Okay. And Cecilia will 
moved the presenter control over to Matt Cotton. And so Matt has 30 years of experience in the composting industry. He has permitted and helped develop some of the major facilities throughout California. He's worked on numerous statewide projects for CalRecycle and has spent almost two decades on the U.S. Composting Council's board, including three terms as president. He is the lead instructor for the U.S. Composting Council's 40-hour compost operator training course in California and is the main author of Swana's Organics Collection and manager of the composting program's courses. And I have to say, I attended one of the, the U.S. composting classes here in California, and Matt was there and did a great job. So, Matt, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Kimberly. Thanks for the kind words. Yeah, I, I miss doing those uh, in-person classes. That was one of the last ones we got to do before COVID, and I, I do miss instructing those classes. Um, but thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for taking your lunch hour, and uh, thanks, Swana, for taking the best of this content that they had for the Western Regional. and put it out here for us. Um, really enjoyed John, great presentation um, and some good news there. It sounded like a lot of granular detail on how hard it is to permit composting sites, but John also told us that he just was involved in an additional 1.2 million tons, So, which really works well in my presentation. He also mentioned the, uh, the VOC emission report that CalRecycle is doing. We just started, we just kicked off that. I'm involved in that project. We just kicked that off last week. I actually spent a couple of days last week out at the Napa facility uh, doing some measurements of VOCs and lots of other things, pH, maturity, and temperature, et cetera. So um, yeah, this is hard, um, but there is uh, some good hope, uh, some outlook there in the future. Uh, Cal Recycle understands that we're trying to figure out a cheaper way to measure some of this stuff and bring the cost down. But, uh, but despite that, we are building new facilities. So that's exciting. Um, I've used this slide before for a SWANA talk, um, and I think the one thing I want you to remember about this slide, it's kind of a joke slide about where we are, at least where we were, you know, as far as building, bridging the gap of infrastructure for, for SB 1383. But, but I want you to remember uh, just two things from this presentation. One is that they had cars before they invested the capital and built this bridge, right? They didn't just decide to build a bridge and hope that someone would invent a car. Let's keep that in mind. Okay. Guess I have to do it this way. Let me try to go forward. So I've done this report before, uh, three other times. Uh, similar approach, talking to all the composting facilities, survey questions, survey group. Uh, for the latest one, we talked to all the 50 largest composters in the state, all the anaerobic digesters, got a lot of data, really focused on SB 1383 and capacity. Um, big focus on climate change, of course, um, but similar process, really just hard work of developing a survey instrument, talking to facilities, hound dogging facilities, and, and really getting them to provide a lot of data. Uh, the report is on the CalRecycle website. Actually, all four of the reports are on the CalRecycle website. There's a lot of stuff there. I don't have time to get into uh, too much granularity there, but there's a lot of material there as far as what those facilities look like, the type of feedstocks they're taking, where they're located, et cetera. And for the first time, we actually surveyed uh, uh, many of the AD facilities. There aren't as many as you think, uh, but we got about 10 of them to provide information to us, which was uh, interesting as well. So um, this is an old slide from 2014. Uh, not surprisingly, there's a lot of uh, organics still in the waste stream, right? And I was looking through this this morning and realized I hadn't updated. So I looked at the more recent data. Oh, look, there's still 34% of what we throw away as organic. So. Uh, we haven't made as much progress as we'd hoped, and there's still a lot of food waste in the waste stream, um, probably a whole lot more food waste in the residential stream uh, than we ever would have imagined, given what's going on with COVID. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but in case anyone's wondering, this is why we're this is why we're doing 1383, because there's a lot of food, a lot of organic still in the waste stream, and that's leading to uh, methane gas, some controlled, a lot of it uncontrolled, and uh, I think we're learning about how much of that is uncontrolled and how much that's leading to climate change. So a couple of highlights of the survey, uh, looking at ownership, this is kind of a stark fact that uh, three quarters of facilities out there are privately owned. I think that's important. I think that's also changing where I could do this uh, survey in the next five years. I think we'd find that there's actually going to be more publicly owned uh, facilities. I see a lot of activity with uh, counties, particularly uh, permitting uh, capacity out there at landfills and other sites. Uh, but at the moment, 
at least as of 2019, uh, you know, three quarters of these facilities were privately owned. So you're talking about hauling companies, private individuals, um, you know, some large, some small, but um, some affiliated with landfills and transfer stations, but others just standalone composting sites. So um, I think that's interesting. Um, when we asked them in 2019 about expansion plans, and again, this was before, uh, this was not before 1383, it was certainly before the regulations for 1383 and uh, the CEQA first 1383, but at that time, uh, you know, 70% of them were not planning to do any expansion uh, and only a third of them were. So that's really interesting. Um, and I think that says a lot. I think there's, and again, getting back to my early, my, my opening slide about the gap and the need for cars, um, uh, there's a chicken and egg situation here and I'll get into that. Um, and this slide really, I think, highlights it as well. There's a lot of capacity out there. The report showed over 4 million tons of available capacity. This is in daily tons per day capacity. So 22% had over 500 tons per day of available capacity. And I bring this up and capacity, you can talk about capacity. It's a complicated subject. There's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of ways to look at it, but um, there's a, a dominant paradigm, let's say, certainly within SWANA, uh, the friends I talked to in Southern California, that there just aren't facilities out there. There's just no capacity and therefore we can't do anything. We can't meet AB, uh, SB 1383. We can't do a program. We've got to have the capacity. We need to have program, you know, facilities out there just sitting waiting for us to develop collection programs. And so let's go up this little graphic and stay with me here. It's a little little fancy, um, but it's a chicken and egg situation, right? Which came first, the facility, the hauling contract or the hauling program, the collection program or the facility? And I've used this a lot. I've done the chicken and egg thing a lot. It's a simple graphic, it usually gets a laugh when you're at a conference. Um, but I'm 100% convinced now, having done this survey, having talked to folks, the permit a lot of facilities, work with guys like John doing emission stuff, um, work with BAQMD a lot, um, you know, the collection facilities really drive new new compost facilities, new compost capacity, new infrastructure, the investments in infrastructure, all the stuff that John just showed us costs money. Now, fantastically, because of better ways to calculate emissions, better ways to measure emissions, hopefully cheaper ways to measure emissions, hopefully those offsets, et cetera, aren't as expensive as we'd feared. And clearly he's able to develop new capacity for clients which is fantastic, but you wouldn't do that unless you have a collection program. And I, I really, this is the one idea I really want to stick in your head for this webinar. Um, we've really got to have the collection programs. We don't have trucks of food waste running around looking for somewhere to go. That just is not the reality. And you just can't build it and hope they come. Back in the 90s, yeah, you could build a site and probably get a loan from a bank and say, look at AB 939, we're going to build this site and people develop collection programs given the costs the state water board costs, the air regulations, offset costs, source tests, et cetera, you just can't do that anymore. So you really have to have the collection programs before anyone's gonna commit to the capital, the operating, the time. John threw out a number of two years uh, to permit a facility. I don't think he's way off with that in some cases, certainly in urban situations. Um, so you really gotta think about these collection programs and of course, we're in a time of COVID, but, but let me show you an example. I know Tom Petrulis is on the line, or at least he was initially. This is his site. This is the uh, Frank Bowerman landfill, one of the great uh, significant users of ADC down in Orange County. And look, uh, they are suddenly doing compost. And this is just a pilot. This is a few months back. We were teaching a class down there, but they are piloting compost for their landfills. They are moving forward because the legislature says we can't use Green waste is ADC anymore. So this is not new material. This is material that was coming to the landfill and now they're composting it. Um, are they gonna have to get air permits? Yes. They're gonna have to look at technology? Yes. Go, go through CEQA? Certainly. But it just isn't that hard. It's doable if you have the material. He already had the material, so he could go forward with that. So again, you really have to have the collection programs before any, any reasonable person is gonna make the investment, the capital investment, the permitting investment, the time, the stress, to permit a facility. Um, as far as a COVID update, um, residential food scraps are at an all-time high. Uh, commercial food scraps are down significantly. Some projects that were in the pipeline are just not going to happen because commercial food waste is so, at the very least, 
um, inconsistent or unpredictable. Um, a lot of scrambling for food rescue, which is exciting. Um, composters who access the homeowner markets are having record sales. So markets are great as always. They're different, but they're still great. Um, I believe consumers are wanting more, not less recycling. Um, and about, we don't have really good numbers on this, unfortunately, but at least 300 jurisdictions in California have residential curbside greenways. Cal Recycle actually predicted a bigger number in 2016 or published a bigger number. I don't know how much faith I have in that number, but most of the big urban cities in California have curbside weekly garbage collections. Some of those are still every other week, but the majority of them are weekly curbside green waste collection. It's really simple. These are weird times. We don't know where budgets are. We're certainly not going to do outreach and, and make our commercial generators start a food waste program. That's just not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but what can we do? How people put the food waste in the green waste. This is easy. This is something foreseen by 1383. There's a lot of talk about, will we change the deadlines? What are we going to do about 1383? Can we back off on the enforcement? Well, maybe you can, and again, I know the, the law doesn't use the term good faith effort, but certainly it's a really interesting time to think about having a pilot, trying it out, letting your residents put food waste in the green waste. It's easy to do. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Sure, there's program administration involved, but they've already got the cart. <laughs> Maybe they need an interior cart. There are some costs, but as far as low cost, low rate impact, low pain points as far as change behavior, this is really quite easy to do. There are plenty of jurisdictions that already do this, but not nearly enough. 1383 envisions everyone doing this eventually. And yeah, if, if COVID hadn't happened, we'd probably say, no, start with commercial, bigger bang for the buck, cleaner material. But uh, turns out if you're not paying attention, everything has changed. So I get a lot of questions about what can we do now? Because um, a lot of people, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. I appreciate that. Um, it's a hard time to roll out a new program, but we are going to get past this. We're going to get back. 1383 isn't going away. Climate change isn't going away. So this is something you could do um, in the short term. I'm not saying, you know, start it tomorrow or start telling your residents to do it tomorrow, but think about it, roll it out. A um, lot of good examples out there. I, I uh, Just before COVID moved to Berkeley, Berkeley's been collecting food waste and the green waste since 1997. So again, this is not a super new program, um, something you can do in the short term. Um, getting back to the survey for a minute, as far as uh, markets, I get this question a lot too. Oh, are we gonna, I'm, <laughs> I've been in California since 1990 doing uh, composting work and every Almost since the beginning, people have said, oh, we're going to be buried in compost, AB 939. We're going to be buried in compost. We'll never have enough markets for compost. I've been doing this for 25 years. It's never happened. The latest data from the survey, again, talking to the 50 largest composters, we have no problem with markets. It's agriculture, we have the best agriculture in the world, the biggest, most intense agriculture in the world, 65%, which is up from the last survey, which was 50-something percent. 65% um, of our compost now goes to agriculture. Um, a lot of it's going to landscape. Um, so we have amazing markets in California. There's a study that came out of UC Merced recently doing a different approach, kind of a very different approach to estimating the same amount. Could agriculture absorb all this compost? They came out with something like eight times. So there's, there's a huge potential. Uh, there's actually, well, let me, let me back up. There's a tremendous amount of compost going to agriculture right now, and there's potential for a lot more to go. So do not worry about markets. Um, Kimberly does a great job all day, every day selling compost. Um, she could tell you this probably better than I do. Things like almonds, things like grapes. I could do this all day. If you're in the, if you're selling, you know, bag product to retail right now. I don't know if any of you have been to a nursery lately. Uh, around here, there are lines around the block every single day. Everybody's gardening. Everybody's planting stuff. They're improving their lawn. They're buying compost. Most of the composters I work with, and actually composters I talk to around the country, are having amazing years. They're selling more compost than they've ever sold. Um, facilities that have struggled and sometimes are sold out of compost. So uh, amazing things are happening. Uh, there are some, I guess, some silver linings to this otherwise dreadful period. Um, and quick plug, uh, we're doing a workshop in a couple weeks. Uh, Caltrans, uh, Cal Recycle and Caltrans have been partnering for, for decades trying to increase the use of compost by Caltrans. They're uh, potentially an enormous user, a lot of applications, and there's an incredible amount of information developed, specifications, users, 
Um, lots of cool stuff out there. So we're doing a workshop. This was going to be workshops around the state, of course. Uh, now it's going to be a webinar. So uh, I invite you to that. I'll make sure that the webinar gets sent uh, out to the SWANA list. But getting back to the markets, uh, the most recent report, the Caltrans number is 5%. So that was not always the case. The last three reports, the amount of compost used by Caltrans was about 1%, which is still significant, but not that significant. Um, we've done a lot of outreach, we've done a lot of work, workshops, and over time, you know, I remember working with Caltrans in the 90s, doing workshops, doing outreach, getting them to use compost, getting them to try it. Now it's 5%, at least it's reported to be 5% of the entire market. So that's significant and it's moving, it's good news. Um, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Matt, thank you. And, and I actually did want to make a comment. So. I, I agree 100% in regards to the outlet for the compost. Agriculture can consume what's being produced not only now, but for years to come, many times over. The challenge and the major disconnect that I've seen is the cost of the compost and the, the price that the farmer is able and willing to pay. That's where I've continually seen huge disconnects. Uh, and it, 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 it's, I've had it's really more of an art and a science because it's not necessarily about dropping the, the price of the compost uh, because that'll tank it and make the market a bit unstable. But for the compost sites that are really confident my compost is worth X amount, then they may have a lot more challenge moving it to the farms, especially if it's been a, a tough year for the farmers. So um, it's an interesting situation, but absolutely agriculture can take all, all of the compost that we have. We did get one question, that's to the group, and so I'll save that for the end. Neil Bolton has more than 42 years of experience in the solid waste industry. In 1988, Neil Bolton formed his own consulting company, Blue Ridge Services. His team provides operational consulting services for a wide range of private and municipal solid waste and recycling facilities, landfills, transfer stations, collections operations, material recovery facilities, and green waste facilities throughout North America and abroad. He is the author of the Handbook of Landfill Operations and created the industry's most comprehensive safety training program for transfer stations, landfills, and collections. He and his team have pioneered the use of process improvement tools in the solid waste industry and have broken new ground with the use of drone technology for waste management mapping and planning. Neil, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Kimberly. Welcome, everyone. So. Um, I'm gonna go through some stuff pretty quickly. We've had a lot of good information today regarding permitting and some of the technical compliance side of that. And really good news for me to hear um, from Matt regarding market capacity and that we've got you know lots of horizon out there in terms of market. I wanna talk more about some of the practical applications that SB 1383 is gonna to bring to the industry and just organics processing in general. Um, this, it, you know, it, it's one of those things where, what do they say, um, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. And so when we get into the, the place where we're actually implementing some of these programs, um, you know, it's, it's, it's trickier than it sounds, and there's a lot of things to think about before we jump headlong into something. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the source, what, you know, where are we going to find feedstock? Where are those materials originating? Which ones will we target first? It's not a matter of just going out and saying, hey, I'm gonna just divert all organics in my waste stream. There will be some that will be more cost effective and some that will be more difficult to target. But using GIS and some good old fashioned detective work and relying on some of the studies that have been done, some that, that Matt talked about and others, you can identify where the particular zones are where you can find that specific or those specific types of organics that you want to target and be strategic about how you do that. You're gonna to have to balance the compliance and the finance part of this. You know, I think we've learned something from um, the years under AB 939, and that is that we have, to, we have to pay attention to the economics, to the finances of everything that we do and organics processing and eliminating organics from the landfill waste stream is no different. So where do we start? You know, food waste, green waste, textiles. I've heard people say, oh, now we're gonna have to go divert cotton socks because they're organic. 
um, certainly there are going to be priorities. We've got some infrastructure already set up. As Matt, you know, wisely pointed out, we have in many cases infrastructure where we're collecting green waste and to integrate food waste into those containers does not require an entire reset of our system. Certainly it may change the frequency at which we pick up those containers. You know, food waste in a residential container for two weeks may not be very good, but we have part of that infrastructure in place. And again, that's the strategic part of this is figuring out where do we start? You know, what are we, what are we looking for? Some organics will be easier to divert than others. We learned this through general recycling under AB 939 in California and across the country and really across the world. As we target and set goals for recycling waste materials, there are some winners and some losers out there in terms of which materials we should go after. And we want to be strategic because we still have to balance the financial part, even as we deal with and address the compliance issues for that. We have to build a paying system. In other words, this has to carry its own weight. And a lot of folks miss that with um, recycling in the past. And that's that those chickens have come home to roost, so to speak. And um, we want to make sure that we have the financial aspect figured into that. So I've talked to a number of um, folks in the industry. And when they talk about being able to finance and cover the cost of AB or of SB 1383, you know, they're talking about maybe we can stand a few dollars per ton for local residents. In some cases, that may be adequate. In some cases, it may not even be close to adequate. But those are things we have to identify ahead of time because whatever we do in terms of organics diversion, those systems have to be self-supporting. We have to address it like a business because we will be decreasing other sources of revenue, i.e. landfill revenue, once we start the organics diversion process. So before we dive headfirst into that, we wanna step back and evaluate how we're, gonna, how we're gonna do that. Here are some key questions. How will you collect the organic portion of your waste stream? How are you gonna sort it? How are you gonna minimize contamination if we start moving materials into different bins, different containers, different collection systems? How are we going to minimize contamination of that? How are we going to process that? Is that something we'll do in-house? Are we going to outsource that? What products will we produce? And that depends in, in, in large part on what folks like Matt and Kimberly would tell us about where we are. Are we in an urban environment? Are we in an agricultural area? Are we in a more rural area? Each one of those different types of um, demographics we'll be looking for different types of products. So we wanna be able to understand that. Um, again, understanding the market. How long is it gonna to take to create those systems? So early on, we heard two to three years for the permitting process. I suspect that can vary depending on the location, and uh, what, what region we're in, what our local population is like in terms of just the culture, and how much money is it gonna to take to run those systems? So could you or should you, the late Peter Drucker said there's nothing so useless as doing with great efficiency that which should not be done at all. And I'm certainly not saying we shouldn't be diverting organics. I'm saying we should do it wisely and pick and choose which ones we can do most effectively. What is your organization's capacity? Do you want to take this on? Would it be better to outsource? Are there, are there some local or regional facilities that, could already, that are already in place that could help handle this? And who are the other stakeholders? You know, we need to think big picture. We need to think long term. It's kind of exciting to go out and start a new program. And, and for many people, for many organizations, organics diversion is going to be an entirely new program. There are a lot of existing programs, but this is new for a lot of folks. We need to think big picture and long term how we're going to make that be sustainable. You know, I get to travel around the world extensively in my work, and I've been able to interact with a lot of folks in the waste industry in that regard. Very often I hear people say, hey, how can we emulate the success of California's recycling program? And they're talking about AB 939. What I tell them is we need to do that very carefully. I'm gonna streak through some of this stuff and get to some of the other things that I think are more critical in our, in our discussion. When we get to the landfill side of this, we're gonna we're going be affecting not only collections, and processing, et cetera. But when you get to the landfill side, we are going to reduce our revenue when we start diverting organics from the waste stream. 
it's a simple relationship that as tons per day decreases, the cost per ton increases, and that's simply an economy of scale factor. We're also going to see a significant drop in compaction density. When we take the moisture out of the waste stream at a landfill, we're not going to achieve the compaction that we normally would achieve. That's going to change the AUF or the airspace utilization factor that we use to calculate landfill capacity. <clears throat> Where are we going to get that moisture? That's going to be a question on how we might do that. Maybe we're going to be looking at more uh, bioreactor type landfills. Our airspace projections are going to change. We're going to be getting less compaction density, but we're going to be putting a lot less waste in the landfill. So what's the impact on your annual fill string sequence planning, your closure date? This is going to impact a lot of things that you're, you're banking on right now in terms of what your financial set aside is for a closure, post-closure, um, when you're going to actually close your landfill, et cetera. A big issue is going to be, let me get if I, if I can jump over to this, um, Landfill gas to energy. There are, according to LMOP, the EPA's uh, landfill methane outreach program, there are over 600 um, active landfill gas to energy projects in the United States. A number of those are in California. And those are developed, and designed, and funded based on how much gas we're gonna produce. When we pull the organics out of the waste stream, we basically pull much of the gas production capacity out of a landfill. That's something that we're going to have to be looking at. So our gas production is going to reduce. How are we going to adapt to that? So um, let me just move back over here. Kind of in summary, I know I had to go through pretty quickly. I had more slides than I really needed to have. I'm sure this will be available for you to have a copy of it to look at it later. But the gist of it is that while we know we're going to do this, the regulations are going to require that, we have the capacity to do that. We need to make sure that we're thinking about the cost and the practical application so that as we start that process, we're making wise decisions that we can live with, that we can pay for, and that are sustainable. So that's the conclusion. Kimberly, we've got a few minutes for questions, and we can go ahead and hand that back to you if you like. Okay, great. Uh, so we've got several questions here. Now, we won't have time to get through all the questions. so. When the webinar is finished, I'll leave the screen and the webinar running for a bit. I'll stop recording. So in the case that any of the presenters do want to answer some of the questions in the chat box, you're welcome to do that. Um, one question here that I have, uh, and I'll just go in the order of uh, John, Matt, and Neil in the case that you have any thoughts here. So uh, any opinion from the speakers on whether a program EIR for composting facilities similar to what CalRecycle did for anaerobic digestion, would assist with getting compost facilities permitted faster? Um, this is John Kohler. I can just say, uh, I assume my mic is on. People can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, all right, fine. Good, that works. <laughs> I would say that um, for air agencies, they still have to go through their uh, process to Make sure that your quality, your your meeting uh, all the air quality standards before you can receive a permit. Um, they will also be reviewing EIRs. You're talking about programmatic EIR. Uh, it may help facilitate the permit application and uh, uh, be able to increase the ability to 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 address the comments and questions that they come up. But you still you still got to go through their their process on getting a permit, and including uh, the uh, emissions review. Okay, Matt, any thoughts? I know you put a comment in the chat box about it. Yeah, I just, I, I'm sure Larry's aware of that. I, I think the, uh, I don't know the answer to the question, Larry. I was involved in the, the programmatic EIR for AD. I think that helped some facilities, although obviously development of those has slowed down considerably. Um, I think there's a lot of information in the programmatic EIR that was done for 1383, which contains a lot of stuff on organics and composting. So I don't see CalRecycle doing a programmatic EIR for composting, but there are a lot of resources out there for new folks doing new SQL work. Okay, Neil, any thoughts? Or did we pretty much cover it? Well, I think these guys are the experts in that aspect of it. Okay, and I'll take one more question here. For facilities that used site-specific data to establish emissions factors, 
Did they have difficulty in demonstrating compliance with permitted emissions limits through performance testing after construction? And in any order, I'll let you jump in to respond. Well, on some of the ones I talked about, uh, uh, in a couple of those cases, the permits aren't there, aren't uh, out yet. So it's still going to be uh, either under review or in one case, the application was recently submitted. Um, so I don't know if I can provide a, a solid answer on that. The previous application has had used the default factors, um, but the district would be uh, looking at those source tests and, and uh, uh, it, it is hopeful that the ones that were done showing much lower emissions will, will result in an easier uh, compliance in terms of the uh, offsets cost, but I, I don't really have anything to add to that uh, right now. And I think that the Cal's Recycle Project is going to be looking at, uh, that, that Matt was talking, that I mentioned and Matt's involved with, is going to be looking at those kind of issues as well getting all the information that's out there currently and in, uh, in other research to help to help in that area. Okay, great. Any other thoughts? No, I think that's fine. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, does uh, now, Matt? I know you've been re replying to some of them here, so we have a lot of questions. Uh, there's a chance some of these may have been answered, but uh, I'll go for another one here. Does adding food waste to clean green impact to VOCs or odors? <laughs> yeah, I was. As, if you if you look at the questions I answered, I tried to get the easy ones, and that's a harder one. Um, <laughs> the simple answer is yes. Um, I don't think we know how much, I, and I think um, I don't want to. Be talking too much about this uh, calorie cycle study. We've really just gotten started on it, but the idea is to try to understand more from a compost process standpoint how ma maximizing the efficiency of the composting process, really dialing in the process parameters, affects the VOC generation. Previously, the work that's been done to date really looks at a uh, VOC emission rate for a, a given feedstock. So, green waste is this food waste is this, and I don't think it's that simple. So I don't have a good answer for you, Deep Deep, but uh, I hope to in about a year or so. It's very exciting work. Um, it's very complicated work. Um, it's a lot of field work, and uh, we'll see if we can't come up with uh, some better ideas of how to run facilities to reduce emissions and also cheaper ways to uh, measure those emissions. Yeah, this is Neil. I would agree with Matt. I believe that you know, sites are site specific when it comes to how food waste might affect emissions or odors. And sometimes the way that we process that material, the time that those loads come into the facility, there are a lot of variables out there. Uh, but certainly, you know, putting additional amount of food waste in that feedstock will have some impact. I agree with Matt. We don't have that all quantified yet, but that's something we're going to have to watch closely, and that will be a site specific issue. 100%, Neil, and, and again, process specific too. How how you accomplish that composting is going to have an impact. At least that's our thesis for the, the VOC study. Yeah, exactly. Well, great. We're at time at this point. I know we didn't get to answer all the questions. So, like I mentioned, when we're done here, and actually, I'm going to stop the recording now, and uh, and I'll leave it available for.